and welcome to Reclaiming My Life. I am so excited to introduce to you all my special guest, season one of Reclaiming My Life co-author, my sister friend, my birthday twin, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Tiffany Tyson. Welcome, hey, to sis. <laughs> Hey, you like that, didn't you? I love that. I was like, she's rhyming today. I said, I love that. I love that. Yes, yes. It's so good to see you and it's have you back you. right here on this platform with me, reclaiming my life. Yes, thank you so much for the invite. Yes, absolutely. You know, sister friend, wow, what a journey. <laughs> yes. You know, um, Reclaiming My Life. We just launched After the Storm. Yes. And you know, I'm truly honored that you have joined me in both books. Reclaiming My Life, you talked about There is Hope. And then in After the Storm, Perfect Peace. Talk to the people. Yes. You know what? This is 2023. And it's time for people to not only have hope, but to reclaim their perfect peace you yeah. know when your peace gets interrupted you can't sleep at night you're feeling anxious you're discontent you even might have migraines and so sometimes you gotta let some things go you gotta forgive you gotta forget and you gotta pray yes you know what and so when you pray and you keep your mind focused on God and you work the word, guess what? You're going to remain in perfect peace. There are going to be some challenging days, some challenging times, but you pick up that word, that word is going to help you get through. You fall down on your knees and pray, and God is going to help you. And you know what? When you stay in perfect peace, you're also able to, guess what? Stay in your purpose. Come on now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know, and it's a good word for the people, you know, because so many people are not in perfect peace. Mm -mm. You know, so many people, they don't have hope, you know, so your chapters, you know, they are so important in the book because, you know, we have co-authors that are talking about the trials they've gone through, the trauma they've experienced, you know, the storms, you know, then you would come behind it all with, you know, perfect peace and, mm -hmm. you know, giving people hope, mm -hmm. you know, but where do you pull most of, most of that from yourself? You know what? Sometimes I not only think about sessions that I've had in, in the office and what people are dealing with, and sometimes people don't have um, support. It's very important to have support in your life, whether it's your family, your friends, your pastor, your coworker, somebody you can trust, though, that's not going to have your business out on the street or on Facebook, right. but someone that you can trust. And sometimes um, these individuals, because of their environment or people that they've been around, they weren't able to pick up coping skills. Right. And so coping skills can be anything, again, going back to prayer, can be writing in your daily journal, thinking about gratitude sometimes, or even just self-appreciation, because sometimes we can get so caught up into what we don't have, we're missing out on what we do have, because you know what? God has given us all a gift and a purpose. Yes. But sometimes we have to let go of the noise that's either going on in our heads or let go of the noise that we're hearing from. Sometimes you can have some negative family and friends. And that's why you got to let those people go. You yes. have to stay around positive people and people that are pouring into you and speaking, speaking life into your goals and, and, you know, just loving up on you and supporting you in your dreams. Yes. Yes. You know, I love that you said that, you know, because you say you can have people that are not positive in your circle. Yes. But don't realize that, you know, because, Say, you know, you and I, we're friends. I mean, we don't have this issue, you know, because no, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving an example here. But, you know, say you and I, we're friends, you know, and you're saying, you know, I think I want to do this. And, you know, you got so many goals and, you know, so many dreams. And I'm saying, well, you know, you're already doing that. You know, you think that that's not positive. That's not rooting you on. Sometimes people want you to stay in the same space 
because they don't, they don't want to elevate. They don't want you to elevate. You know, yeah. they're comfortable. So, you know, they feel that if you elevate, then they won't have you as a friend, which is selfish, you know? So I love that you said, have positive people in your circle. You may have a circle, but it's not always positive, you know? So look, we got this book coming up. Yes. <laughs> You know, but that's God. That's God because we've seen from the very beginning in reclaiming my life. Then we, you know, doing the podcast, reclaiming my life right here on Preach the Word Worldwide Network, reclaiming my life. I mean, you know, God gave me the vision. I'm the visionary author of the books. But when I tell you that he is moving mountains, yeah. People are coming to us saying, I'm inspired, I'm yeah. motivated, I'm empowered. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You know, so here you are, you know, you riding with me. You ride, you still ride. <laughs> still ride. <laughs> what are you looking forward to the most in this upcoming, the final chapter? Reclaiming my life after the storm. You know what, just continuing to inspire people in their day-to-day -day lives, whether it's, you know, whether they're going and trying out for a job. And sometimes people, they feel like, you know, again, I've been through all of this. I don't feel like I'm worthy enough to go after my dreams. My dreams may be to be a lawyer, to be a teacher, to be next congressman, but they may feel like their past is holding them back. So just to continue to inspire people and to let people hear hear the stories because they're like, wow, they may be feeling like they're the only person that's dealing with this. But when they hear the stories of others and how they were able to overcome, they can sit back and say, wow, if they can overcome that, I can overcome that and be yes. the best them. Yes. Dr. Tyson, let the people know how they can connect with you. You know what? You can connect with me through Tyson Multimedia, info at Tyson Multimedia or 252-281-4884. Awesome. Thank you so much for stopping by. And you know Thank you must you join me again right here on Reclaiming My Life. <laughs> we'll be right back. And we're back. And now I have another beautiful, beautiful special guest, co-author of After the Storm. Miss Patrice Baxter. Hello, everyone. Hello, beautiful. How are you? I'm doing well. <laughs> awesome. You know, I'm so excited and still on a high from my book launch after the storm. Now, you talked about addictions or addicted, but not the addict. Right. Talk to us. <laughs> well, I wanted to bring to light that when a person is addicted to uh, drugs or alcohol, it doesn't just affect them, it affects their family members as well or their loved ones. And it's, you know, most people just concentrate on the addict and getting them back together and getting them back on the right track. But the family members are affected as well and loved ones are affected as well because they have been through from the beginning of the addiction all the way through them getting better, they went through that part and they have feelings and things that have happened to them that they're trying to deal with too. And, you know, and sometimes it's not always the greatest situation when somebody is going through their addiction and they break a lot of people, like burn bridges with those people or those people don't trust them anymore. And it's really hard for you to drain your trust back to with that person that was addicted if you've been hurt or you know like some people actually go to the point where they steal from them and it, it's a lot to deal with and that's why i wanted to talk about you know being the addict but you're addicted but you're not the addict because sometimes people just absolutely forget about the other people that um are affected by the addiction right right absolutely let me ask you you know with you being um you know, in relationships with people, you know, whether it's friends or family members, you know, how did it affect you personally watching a loved one uh, be addicted 
you know, and, and how did you feel? Did you feel helpless? I mean, can you go into that a little bit? Well, a lot of the times I felt you go through different phases. The first phase is angry and, you know, you try to, you, but you think talking to them that they're going to change. But once you get into it, like the different levels of it, I actually went to a therapist, a therapy session with my ex-husband and he really broke it down to me so that I could understand going forward that when you're dealing with a person that is an addict, it's not them. It's like something is controlling their mind. It's not the person that you love and care about. So when you start to see it from that perspective, it puts a twist on everything because you have to keep telling yourself, that's that's not my loved one. They're acting out like this because of the drugs or the alcohol. So right. as me, how it affected me is at the beginning, you be angry, then you are hurt. And then you're like, God, why is this happening to me? You know, it makes you feel like, um, why am I with this person and I'm going through all of this? You know, why do I why do I have to be the person that go through this as well? So it, it's a lot of different stages that you go through when you're going through with an addict. But if you hang in there and try to see it from that point of view that this is not my loved one, it's somebody else, you can get through it. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that you won't get mad, you won't be angry, <laughs> you won't be disappointed, right. but you can get through it. You just have to be willing to get through it. Right. You know, one thing that I loved about your story, um, Patrice, you had a happy ending, you know, and it reminded me of a marriage. And although, you know, you, you we're talking about a marriage, but, you know, um, a lot of times when we're going through different trials in our marriages, we, you know, too quickly give up, right? I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I'm gone. We, we forget about the vows for better or for worse. You know, if one is sick, oh, I, I'm tired of taking care of you and I'm gone. Or, you know, if one lost a job and now you're financially struggling, oh, I don't want to be with you anymore. I'm gone. You know, so many different reasons why marriages fail, you know, but what I love most about your story, you stuck it out. You know, you went through so many different phases, you know, of hurt, being angry, probably feeling alone a lot of the time, you know, but you stuck it out and you have a happy ending, yes. you know? What if you had given up? And this is what I love to say to married couples so often, like <laughs> you really left because y'all hit a rough patch, you know, with your finances or because, you know, your spouse got sick, you know, we don't stick it out. What what happened to the, for the worst part? Well, that's this generation. It's, it's like the throwaway generation. If things ain't working out, they are gone. They throw it away. <laughs> they yes. give up. Yeah. Yes. And going through the different things that I was going through, um, my mom, she was like, God will work it. I never forget her words for as long as I live. She was like, God will work it out. She said, now God is true to his word. He will work it out. She said, but are you willing to wait for him to yes. work it out? Because it's not going to be on your time. It's going to be on his time. Yeah. On. So one more time. And, Give us mama words one more time. <laughs> you know? God is work that out. Part and be patient. Yeah, you got to be patient. Yeah. And I was patient and it worked out for because like I said, if I hadn't waited, I wouldn't get to see my husband like he is now. Yes. And it it just it just made me feel glad that I waited. Cause now yeah. we're in a whole different, you know, setting. It's like we did make it through the hurricane, the storm, all of that put in the one. <laughs> yeah. We made it through there and now things are way better than they were ever before. Oh, come on with your testimony, girl. And <laughs> yeah. I'm so happy for you. I'm Thank so you. happy that you reclaimed after the storm, baby. Yes. Yeah, you just <laughs> gave a word to the people. Y'all listen now. It was a lot of nuggets in that. A lot of nuggets. You know, let the people know, Patrice, how can they connect with you? Um, I have my email, which is patricekelvin39 at gmail.com. 
I'm on Facebook and Instagram as, as Patrice Baxter as well. Um, I have a notary loan signing agent business, so you can find me on Google Business as well. If you have anything that, you know, you want to ask me, I'll be happy to help. I love it. And I love you. And I'm so happy for you. I'm just so happy. And I'm also honored that you're joining the final chapter, Reclaiming My Life After the Storm. That'll be coming out soon as well. Thank you. And I love you too. God yes, bless you. Know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Be blessed. Be blessed. And we'll be right back. And we're back. Today, I am truly, truly honored to have had my co-authors on here of After the Storm joining me, sharing their testimonies. And to end this segment, I have another co-author, Mr. Nasir White. Welcome. Hello. Thank you, Ms. Cody Massey. How are we doing today on this I'm lovely, sure rainy day? Wonderful, wonderful, my friend. How are you? I'm truly blessed. I hear this, I hear this networking. I'm sorry. Found, I'm out here networking. I went, to, I went to the library and I found a way I could talk about the book in the library too, also, and then yeah, the book to the library. Awesome. That's awesome. You know, it was truly an honor to have you in our, um, after the storm. And today I just wanted you to stop by and just talk to the people, give them a snippet of your story. So, you know, they would be so intrigued to purchase your book, you know, and, and I, I know I'm going to say it for you. This this story is dedicated to our military family. Yes. Thank you for your service, Nasir. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate that very much. It's very, very honorable for 22 years. Yes. Give the people a little snippet of your story. Well, a little snippet of my story in the After the, after the Storm book right here. I talk about my military life in the war zone. Uh, I spent 22 years in the military. You know, you always get ready, prepped up, you always train for war. But until you go to the war, it's a whole different thing. Training and being in the war is a whole different thing. So my section, the last book in section, uh, page 83 in the book, right, I talk about my life before I went to the military. I talk about my father, who was in the military, too, also. He served in the, in the Korean War and all that, too, also. He died when I was 15. I talk about my upbringing in, in New York City. I was originally from Brooklyn, Brooklyn, Queens, New York, and uh, joined the military back in August 10th, 1984. I knew I wanted to do because my dad had served too also, and I knew that I wanted to serve too also, and not really following his footsteps, but it was just the right thing to do at the present time when I graduated high school. So during the trainings, I spent a lot of time with different military units, Fort Gordon, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, Fort Gordon, Georgia, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, Fort Bliss, Texas, Fort Hood, Texas, been around different different places to know that. And you train for war with different conflicts coming up in, in the Somalia conflict, Persian Gulf conflict, uh, RF, OEF, different conflicts, different war zones to know that. But my as you read the section in my book, it really impels you what happens after the war. You come home to also suffering post-traumatic stress syndrome, sleep apnea, Different different health elements and everything else too, also, and getting the help that you need as you come home from the war. Yes, yes, and after you came home, of course, like you said, you really suffered from PTSD. You know, and a lot of times, you know, our soldiers are suffering from PTSD. You know, they refuse to go get help. You know, they don't want to be, you know, stigmatized. But you know, let them know how. It has tremendously helped you um, receiving the therapy that you've received. Well, it helped me a whole lot. I went down to McGuire Hospital in, in Richmond, Virginia, where when I first came home in 2005, um, I didn't really see no change too much. I seen some changes, right? I went back to work, but I just noticed some changes already happening. I stayed sheltered. I got depressed and all that. And, um, I didn't think I had a problem because I ain't, ain't gonna be stigmatized by the two also. But during the course of action, I finally went to the VA, going to the different group programs they have down there. I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress syndrome. I was in denial for a while, but then again, with the help of therapy and the medication, and this has been some years, since, since 2005, 
He is now 2023. So just finally reclaiming my life and, and bringing things back into order. You know, it's not, it wasn't an overnight fix. Depression, suicidal, setting in, and everything else. And then all that stuff was real. I went away to the hospital for nine months in Hampton, at, at, at the Hampton VA in Hampton, Virginia. Went down there for a little while. And the, the section of my book just talks about how I overcame the good Lord's blessing and yeah. therapy and everything else too, also to be a manageable person in society. You know what I'm saying? A lot of soldiers come out, they commit suicide because they can't take it. Or they, they wouldn't go back in. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of divorces hit families because they can't take it because they don't know how to respond to be in the civilian world. You've been in military life so long, you've been in the war zone so long, it changes you all the time too also. Yes. And I thank God that we came, I overcame my life to be a better person and to see more things more clearly now. You know, and still, still yeah. going to do some stuff. Still going to do some stuff. But mm -hmm. also, too, I'm nowhere where I used to be at. That's at right. That's right. Glory to God. You know, and I just want to say, you know, that although we're strong, you know, and we want people to see us as strong people, it's okay to not be okay. You know, it's okay to get some help. And to Nasir, I just want to say that glory to God. I'm just so glad that you have reclaimed your life. Yes, after the I storm. have. Yes. yes. Let the people know how they can connect with you so they can purchase well, you, that you book can, and you get can the whole story. You can connect with me, purchase the book, do my, do my email at Nasir White, excuse me, Nasir Wajid at Gmail. I'm also on Facebook as Nasir YJ at Facebook too also. And also too, if you want to call me directly, uh, you can call me and just want to talk if you're a military soldier or a military spouse, you're going through some stuff like that, you know what to do. You can also call me too also because I talk to a lot of military friends that has been going through this uh, also and they're still going through it and we all stay connected because we all have a, a, a background in military stuff and, and sometimes we need some other folks to lean on and sometimes yeah. the, your civilian friends may not understand what you're going through. So you may want to call me at 804-627-1375. The book is it's an outstanding book. And my section of the book is about military life in a war zone. Because it, yeah. really, it really changed you in the war zone. You train up you, you train up, you train up for this event to happen. But once you actually go and happen, it's a totally different thing. And everything's not in the book and in the war zone. You know? Yeah. So hear, hear more of my story. Please connect with me. And I'd be glad to share it with you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for stopping by Reclaiming My Life, Mr. Nasia. Well, I thank you very much too, Ms. Cody Massey. You, you, yes, you, you're so welcome. Larry. You are very welcome. And to our listeners and viewers, we thank you so much also for stopping by Reclaiming My Life. And we will see you all next week. Be blessed. She lives with John 3.16 as a daily reminder. This verse serves as a representation of why she gives so freely of herself, firmly believing that if God could send his one and only son to die for our sins, surely she can give of herself to be of service to others. She has a heart that beats with immeasurable rhythm of caring and love. Her arms continuously stretch longer and longer, and yet they never seem to break. This is all evident by the love, care, and commitment she has as a mother, first raising her three daughters for a while as a single mother. She displays a positive example for her daughters as her mother did for her. Many of us have heard or read stories of the close bond she and her mother had and the love she still has for her mother. When it came to mothering, she didn't stop with just her three daughters. You see, she received a call that there were three little girls, sisters, who needed some extra special love, attention, care, and guidance and she answered that call with a yes. And just when you might think that would be enough just to take care of them, no. 
her love and her heartbeats grew even stronger for them, those arms stretched longer and wider, she gave more of herself and made them legally hers by adopting them. We have a message from her daughters. How tremendously blessed we are to have come from such a woman as our mother. When we think of all she represents, we are amazed at her daily grace, her strength, resiliency, persistence, love, passion, and her unwavering commitment to her faith, her family, and to her community. A message from her husband. She is my everything. Selfless, supportive, nurturing, and patient. She has a heart for God's people and consistently demonstrates this through community service and feeding the homeless. She possesses a love like no other for our entire family, especially our children. She can cook and she does give the best hugs. My mission is to encourage and equip others to believe in the possibilities of a happier, healthier, and fulfill life by inspiring positive change through talk therapy sessions.